All right, we're in, <clears throat> excuse me, we're in John chapter 4 again tonight. We started John 4. I'm on, Phil. I don't have any lights or anything, but it says I'm on. Um, we started John 4 around Thanksgiving last year, so finally going to work our way out. When you find John 4, we'll read beginning in verse 46. <clears throat> Therefore, he, Jesus, came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Father, help us as we work our way through this text this evening and ponder uh, the wonderful miracles of our Lord Jesus. We pray that you would make us uh, conform to the image of our beloved Savior for the time we spend uh, in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. No, nothing? I'll just come down here. I'll just come down here because I don't have a good shouting voice. and uh, so I'll just work from this one. There, that's hot. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm good now? Oh, look at that. It follows me. Okay. All right. So I'll come back up here. All right. What I want to do this evening from this text is, uh, is flesh out and illustrate a statement that we made last week that Jesus' relationship to his miracles was conflicted and complicated. I want to try to explore that a little bit further with you this evening. And, uh, and spend some time pondering that. Now there's a hint, there's a hint of this in verse 44 and verse 45, where Jesus says that a prophet has no honor in his home country. He goes to his home country and the red carpet gets rolled out for him. And so we say, no honor here because it, it seems like there's honor here. But the key phrase is in the heart of verse 45, where John puts this little explanatory note, uh, they received him having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. Now, the things that he did, that phrase refers to the miracles that he performed. And so the Galileans saw him perform miracles. Now, Jesus is coming home to Galilee and there's a huge welcome for him. It's, uh, Jesus says, there's no honor. There's a, there's a welcome, but Jesus says no honor. That's a complicated pair of statements. No honor, and they received him. So John, I think, illustrates the complexity with the following account that is now before us, beginning in verse 46. So as we walk our way through this text, uh, after a, a really long introduction, I want us to specifically focus in on the theology of, of the miraculous. And by the way, I didn't go through all my books, but I went through all the books that I thought would have perhaps good sections on the theology of miracles, and I didn't come across much. So I don't know how much help is out there. I'm sure there's some good stuff, but we're going to try to wade into something that uh, not a lot of material is, is available on the theology of miracles. Let's begin here, because we've said it before, we'll say it again just to be clear. We, as believers, believe in the supernatural. 
We believe there is a natural order of things that is subject to the laws of time and space and matter. And there is a supernatural order of things which are not subject to natural law. And we believe that on occasion, the supernatural order of things invades the natural order. In fact, we even believe that the supernatural order of things created the natural order because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's supernatural creating natural. Natural law says that matter can neither be created nor destroyed because matter, so far as our experience goes, does not simply appear out of non-matter. But that law does not apply to the supernatural realm because God can create something out of nothing. We can create something out of something, but that's not particularly supernatural. Creating something out of nothing is a violation of natural law. Miracles are violations of natural law as well. Water does not turn into wine all by itself. Water sitting in stone jars untouched remains water unless it is acted on by an outside force. And the only outside force you can find in John 2 acting on that water is the will of the Lord Jesus. There's no external physical force acting on that water to cause it to become wine. It is supernatural. And the same goes for this story before us. Little boys on the brink of death do not become perfectly healthy in a moment. There's an unnatural force acting on the body of this little boy because the physical presence of Jesus is at least 16 miles away. Now the Bible records many miracles and miracles we would define as a supernatural event. Axe heads floating, leprosy that comes and goes when Moses puts his hand in and out of his coat, men standing in the middle of a furnace without being burned, huge crowds being fed by a meager amount of food, blind eyes suddenly seeing, and dead people coming back to life. That's not to mention angels that destroy entire armies, fire raining down from heaven and destroying an entire city, or Enoch simply disappearing off of the earth and showing up in the Lord's presence, just to name a few. Now, surrounding the Lord Jesus was a multitude of miracles. The Gospels record many of them, and many of them have not been recorded. John's Gospel is built around seven or eight miracles, depending on how you count them. It stands to reason that as Jesus was both God and man, his divine nature is supernatural, and therefore he can break natural law or perform miracles. And the miracles are very powerful evidence that Jesus of Nazareth is more than a human carpenter. But in Jesus' case, the miraculous power that he possessed and wielded, if you will, created some significant problems. And those problems we begin to see in chapter 2 and verse 23 and in chapter 4 verse 45, where we find Jesus more or less discounting the adoration and admiration of those who loved him because of his miracle working power. And so here's an axiom that's good to remember, and that is simply this. Sin makes things complicated. Uh, before there was sin, remember that there was one law, don't eat from that tree. But after sin, uh, things became a mess, and it's getting messier all the time. If you were in the adult Sunday school class this morning, you would have heard Al Mohler say, quote, there is no simplistic explanation for our sin, unquote. And he went on to reference Romans chapter 7, where we find Paul wrestling through, trying to understand his own sin, and, and finally saying, I just don't even understand myself. Sin makes things complicated. Relationships tainted with sin are complicated. Even the laws that govern sinful behavior become complicated. Families that are tainted by sin are complicated. The number of steps and half-brothers and, and things and so on and so forth is very complicated because of the effects of sin. Uh, churches are complicated. If I've learned anything over the last couple of years wrestling with the moral and sexual revolution taking place across our nation is that 
Thing, even things like gender are suddenly very complicated, not because that root is very difficult to figure out male and female, but, but how to interact in a meaningful, gospel-saturated manner with those who can't figure out the simplicity of gender gets complex. Now back to John 4, Jesus' miracles brought with them a degree of complexity. There is no honor for a prophet in his hometown, and then Jesus comes home and receives what looks like honor, but he knows that it isn't. And that's difficult to understand. That's, that's complex. Furthermore, when you read this account, especially verse 48 and what Jesus says there, you get the feeling that Jesus isn't real happy about performing miracles for these people. But then he goes in performs one. Now this text and, and our thinking about miracles challenges our fundamental assumption, I think, of just who Jesus is and what he was like, is like. So many think that the combination of Jesus' love and power make him the ultimate humanitarian. He has the ability to do anything for anyone, and then you add to that the perfect infinite love that he has for people and you have a recipe for an endless parade of miracles until every problem is solved. I suppose if we had Jesus' ability to perform miracles, we'd be emptying hospitals and nursing homes and there wouldn't be sick, hungry, or impoverished people within a 10 mile radius of us and we would actually feel the responsibility to do that as a responsibility to our fellow human beings. It would be the kind and loving thing to do. I wonder if we've ever stopped long enough to even ponder the question, why did Jesus perform miracles? The most obvious answer is probably simply that he could and can. You'll find, I think, that most of the professing miracle workers of our day claim to have some sort of gift that they feel obligated to share on television. It would, after all, seem rather unkind to be able to do something to help out a person struggling with some sort of problem that you could instantaneously solve and not do it. Here's Jesus with the ability to cure any disease. So it would seem that he is obligated by, well, by the law to love your neighbor, to put his power to work for the good of others. Consider the Good Samaritan, after all. What, what makes the Good Samaritan good? It's the fact that he found someone in need and he had the means to help him, and he did so. Could it not be said that, in a sense, those who are sick have need of someone to stop and help them? And who, who would be more likely to stop and help them than Jesus himself. But in verse 48, Jesus seems rather reluctant, doesn't he? You can almost hear him sighing. In fact, when we get to John 11, you will hear him sighing audibly. It's recorded. Jesus groaning in spirit. Here in verse 48, there's just a hint of that. Now here we have a child on the brink of death. But whatever you make of verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Whatever you make of that, compassion is probably not the first word that comes to your mind. But that's not to say that Jesus never performs miracles with compassion or even out of a sense of compassion. Because Matthew 14, 4, which is Matthew's version of John 6, says that Jesus performed that miracle of feeding the crowd out of his compassion. But here in John 4, Jesus is, or John rather, is not emphasizing the compassionate nature of the Lord Jesus, quite the contrary. So let me try to help us get inside the thought process that might be going through Jesus' mind in a case like this. In Mark 9, verse 43, in a different context, Jesus says this, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. 
It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. Now there's a scale of priorities here that Jesus has. The, the condition of the soul is more important than the condition of the body to Jesus. Better to have a body that is incomplete than a soul that is damned to hell. Jesus' concern for physical well-being is secondary to his primary concern, which is the well-being of the soul. Let me give you an example of this. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says, To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Now exactly what that thorn in the flesh is, is up for debate. Paul calls it also a messenger of Satan to torment him. But I think the phrase, the thorn in the flesh, at least indicates that whatever it was, it had a dimension of some sort of physical torment to it. So Paul did what any of us would do, and that is to pray that God would take it away. But God didn't take it away. In fact, God wouldn't take it away. Why not? He could have, but he wouldn't. Why not? Well, as you read what Paul writes, Paul had been granted such tremendous privilege, he was in danger of ruining himself through exaltation. God gave him the thorn in the flesh to keep him from exalting himself, which is, by the way, a wonderful example of sort of the nuts and the bolts of how the perseverance of the saints works, how God preserves and keeps his own. But here's the point. In God's eyes, better to have Paul suffer physically and keep his soul healthy than to remove his physical problems and allow his soul to be destroyed through self-aggrandizement. Better that Paul enter into heaven with a thorn in the flesh than, having had it taken away, he might enter into condemnation in perfect physical health. And so there's a clear priority of the spiritual above the physical in the eyes of God. And I will say this also, in the eternal state, I think the physical and the spiritual will be perfectly, uh, permanently perfected and coexist in perfect balance and harmony. But in the meantime, uh, physical death is inevitable for every one of us. That is to say, these bodies that you and I possess are destined to fail of something. And so it doesn't seem that Jesus is incredibly obsessed with prolonging the inevitability of death. Every person Jesus healed eventually got sick again and died of something. Even the dead that he raised died again. So the miracles that Jesus performed had limited and temporary impact. The ministry that Jesus was primarily focused on, however, was the ministry of eternal life, not the ministry of temporal, temporal ease. The miracles that Jesus performed were intended to serve the larger, more important purpose of demonstrating Jesus to be the Son of God. And as the Son of God, Jesus is presented to us in John's Gospel as the distributor of eternal life. The problem that we face is that by and large we tend to be far more interested in the state of our body than the state of our soul. We are captivated by the immediate demands of the physical. When we hear Jesus say things like, better to chop off your feet and enter into heaven lame, uh, we often try to soft pedal that as being some sort of a gross overstatement, most because, mostly because I think we just can't imagine the horrors of life without feet. And this is the dilemma that Jesus was facing. Thousands were attracted to his power to work miracles. Jesus could make this life, this physical life, immediately more enjoyable by offering free food, free medical care, and so forth. But few 
could see beyond the physical power into the realm of the spiritual and see that Jesus was not just able to cure physical ailments, but was in fact able to provide eternal life. In other words, people were seeing the miracles, but missing the larger point. We'll see that very explicitly in chapter 6, where Jesus performs the miracle of feeding the 5,000. The crowds then want to make him king, demand a second miracle. Jesus doesn't give them one, but instead demands that they look beyond the free food that they need to eat three times a day. Instead, look to Jesus as the bread from heaven that they need to eat for eternal life. And the crowd goes from wanting to make him king to completely abandoning him. So long as the miracles were popping and hopping, Jesus was in demand. But when the focus went from the miracles that demonstrated the power of Christ to the doctrine that demonstrated the, the person of Christ, suddenly Jesus wasn't so sought after. And so you have this tension, I think, that exists in the mind of the Lord Jesus. The miracles were critical to proving who he was, but they also had this this somewhat counterproductive effect of people getting lost in the wonder of the miracle itself and, and being unable to see through that or, or unwilling to see through that to the glory of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because most people would rather have their ailments removed than their sin. Because it seems to me that we fret far more about the state of our body than the state of our soul. And since Jesus can fix our body, that's very often why we turn to him. It's nice to have a healer for a God, isn't it? It's nice that our God is the great physician. But those who followed after Jesus for no other reason than to have their physical ailments healed weren't really following him the way he should be followed. And Jesus, John 2, 23, knew that. And so every miracle had this, this sort of two-dimensional reaction. On the one hand, those who cared most about their physical, temporal problems found Jesus to be the, the perfect solution. And they were excited about the possibilities of how that kind of power could give them their best life now. And on the other hand, there were a very few who who saw through the miracles to the greater power behind them, the, the power to grant eternal life through the forgiveness of sins and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Now what we have here in the end of John 4 is Jesus masterfully moving a man from the first category of those enamored with the miracle working power of Christ to the second category of those who understand that Jesus is the Son of God and the giver of eternal life. Jesus is going to take this frantic father and move him from seeking after Jesus to be the quick fix of his very real, very urgent problem, the problem of a dying child. We don't want to minimize the uh, trauma that this fellow is going through. But Jesus is going to move him from there to a man who sees Jesus as the Son of God to be adored and worshipped and served. And that's not an easy thing to do, but Jesus does it. And so in a minute we're going to walk through this text and witness the incredible skill of the Lord Jesus. Now the reason that this is so relevant and so incredibly important to wrestle through in a substantive way is that how we understand Jesus' relationship to his miracles affects what our expectations of him are today. How we understand what Jesus did then affects how we, how we understand and expect him to be today. If we understand the Jesus of the New Testament as primarily interested in overcoming the physical obstacles to a person's temporal happiness through the application of supernatural power, which, by the way, many people from all branches of evangelical assume that's what they look for in Jesus. He's the, he's the Jesus who's going to solve all your problems. We're going to necessarily drag that understanding of the Jesus then into our understanding of Jesus now. One of the favorite verses for those involved in what used to be, and maybe still is, called the signs and wonders branch of Christianity 
idea is this. You, you've heard this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he did all those wonderful miracles then. And so we expect him to do them all now. But if we understand Jesus as primarily performing miracles as a sort of humanitarian service, or if we even want to be more nuanced and say that Jesus was expressing his love and affection to those who believe in him, we're going to wind up expecting the same sort of treatment from Jesus that this father gets. We're going to expect our sick children to be healed and our hungry bellies to be fed so that we feel like Jesus loves us. But you and I well know that not all sick children, even the children of Christian parents, survive the danger of childhood illnesses, and some of them die. And the only way any sort of theology of temporal triumph can, can deal with a dilemma like children who die is to create a sort of mechanism by which the one, who needs, the one who needs Jesus accesses his power. We have, we have to find some sort of way that we access Jesus' power so that if the power doesn't show up, we can blame the person who's trying to access it as doing it wrong. We, then we can blame the person for not approaching Jesus correctly. So I mentioned last week that there's a buzzword in Christianity, uh, and, and that is the the word unleashed. And so just for fun, this week I went to a popular Christian book distributor's website and their magazine says everything Christian for less. And so I thought, well, if that's the case, everything in there must be Christian. And so I typed in the, the keyword unleashed. And here's some of what I found. Bill Johnson, Pastor Ivan's good friend from Redding, California, wrote a book called Experience the Impossible, Simple Ways to Unleash Heaven's Power on Earth. And behind that is the idea that the power is there. We just have to figure out how to unleash it, release it. Jesus wants to do all these wonderful things for us and, and heal us and make us uh, everything we want to be. We just have to figure out how to unleash that power. Someone else wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Unleash a Revolution in Your Life in Christ. Someone else wrote Commanding the Morning, Unleash the Power of God in Your Life. One of my grandfather's favorites is uh, T.D. Jakes who wrote Instinct, The Power to Unleash Your Inborn Drive. And I think Grandpa only liked him because he got a kick out of seeing him storm around the stage, yelling and screaming, do all the things that he did. This one, this one is called Juicing, Fasting, and Detoxing for Life. Unleash the healing power of fresh juices and cleansing diets. I have no idea why that's a Christian book, but it reminds me that we live in an age that needs to be reminded of Jesus' words that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of the heart. And, and, and I think sometimes we are guilty of seeking sanctification through nutrition, but that's for another time. I just I said, why, is, why on earth is juicing and detoxing in the Christian bookstore? Anyway, um, here's another one. Clout, discover and unleash your God-given influence. This one seems pertinent. Praying the Gospel of John. Know Jesus? Unleash the power of your faith. Or moving mountains, breaking barriers to unleash your full potential. Or this one, he is with you. Unleash your faith and conquer your worst situations. This is special. Taking on Goliath, how to unleash the David in all of us. And the list goes on. The presumption behind all of these is that Jesus power to fix our temporal and immediate problems is available and he's itching to share it with us if we can just figure out how to access it. That's the only way a book with the title of The Real House of God, Unleash the Power of God's Spirit Within You makes any sense. The power is there, you just need to figure out how to make it work. The, the car is sitting there, you just need the key to turn it on. And once you do, you'll be able to enjoy the devotional called No Cape Required, which promises to give you 52 ways to, quote, unleash your inner hero. 
And herein is the issue at hand. If Jesus is all about putting his miracles to work in order to give me my best life now, at the end of the day, it's all about me. It's all about my inner hero. It's all about my full potential. It's all about making my own perfect kingdom where my children are never sick and we never go hungry. And somewhere along the way, obedience to the point of death has been totally lost and taking up crosses is nowhere to be found in this pile of garbage. It's all about me and my ability to tap into Jesus' power to serve me. But that is a theology that attracts and sells. And that is a theology that even finds its way into the halls of heaven. So in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, Jesus is speaking of a future day when people are actually going to stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And Jesus, on his part, doesn't dispute the claims, but he does say that he will respond, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So let's finally get to the text. It seems here our frantic father is coming to Jesus for one reason. In verse 46 and 47, you see in verse 47, he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, and so he's going to find him. He, he understands the, uh, that Jesus is a miracle worker. He has heard that news. He's called a royal official. Basilikos is the Greek word. It indicates he probably served in the court of Herod Antipas, who's the puppet king of the region of Galilee. He's, he's heard of Jesus, and news of miracles like Jesus performs travels very fast, and he is, in verse 47, absolutely desperate. His son has a fever, and, and though he's a royal official, and I presume that as a royal official, he has access to the best medical care in the area. Absolutely nothing is working. The situation is going from bad to worse until this little boy is on the brink of death. And we can really appreciate, I think, the passion that this father has for his son. And on the other hand, I would also say this as a word of warning, and that is that the cheap miracle workers of our day often prey on the desperate. They, that's where they make their money, on the desperate. But Jesus doesn't do that. But Jesus isn't primarily, and that's an important word, Jesus isn't primarily interested in the health and well-being of the little boy. That's not to say he's disinterested. It's not to say he's apathetic, because he's not. But re Jesus, remember, prioritizes the health of the soul above the health of the body. Better to have a maimed body and eternal life than to enter hell on two healthy legs. We have to keep that in mind. That's the only way you're going to make any sense of that conflicted statement that Jesus makes in verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. That phrase in the New American, simply will not believe, or in the ESV, will not believe, translates to double negative in the Greek, which literally reads, you will not not believe, which is just a way of emphasizing the impossibility of any sort of belief. There is absolutely no way you people will believe apart from signs and wonders. It's, it's a statement of frustration. We'll see that illustrated in further, in further in chapter 6, where the people almost say the same thing to Jesus. <laughs> we'll believe if you do more signs. But Jesus is saying it to them here. But you see that Jesus' first interest, his primary interest, is belief. The Father's first interest is a miracle. And so what Jesus is going to do is take the Father from what is pressing in his mind, the health of his Son, to what is most pressing in Jesus' mind, the health of his soul. Now Jesus isn't being unkind here. But he is being, I think, transparently honest to the point of, I think, potentially offending this poor father in verse 48. This father's motives, such as they are, seem to, seem to be very pure. His son needs help. 
Jesus can give it to him. He really believes that. But Jesus, again, isn't interested in just being sought out as a mere worker of miracles because he is so much more than that. He didn't come here to gather crowds of admiring spectators. He came to gather up the children of God. He came to seek those who will worship in spirit and in truth. Now, how this official felt about what Jesus said in verse 48, we don't know. And Jesus didn't just say it to him either. He was speaking, I think, perhaps primarily to all those standing around waiting for Jesus to do something that would amaze them. I, I often think of the little boy in The Incredibles who's sitting on the tricycle just staring at their house. And they say, what are you doing? What are you looking for? And he says, I don't know, something amazing, I guess. And, and that's kind of what you have surrounding Jesus here, I think, in John 4. This was a perfect situation for these onlookers, and they were ready for it. Here's a frantic father. There's probably a weeping mother. There's a child on the brink of death, and then Jesus is going to be rushed off to their house. And he's going to walk into that room and put his hand on that super hot, sweaty little forehead. And the little boy is going to sit up and smile. And everybody's going to cry tears of joy and hug each other. And they're going to be so thankful to Jesus. And it's all going to be well. But Jesus really wants no part of that scene. And so he rebukes these thrill-seeking spectators rather sharply in verse now the father repeats his urgent request in verse 49. Sir, come down before my child dies. Now it's at this point that the sheer wisdom and genius of Jesus comes into play. There's two things here in this request that, of, that the father makes that betray his, his limited uh, understanding of who Jesus is. The first is that he thinks Jesus has to be personally present. That's in the words, come down. He believes Jesus can perform a miracle, but he thinks that the miracle has to be performed in a certain way, namely that Jesus has to at least be present in person to do it. And Jesus is going to challenge that. And the second presumption the father erroneously makes is that Jesus needs to act before the child dies. That's part of why he's in such a hurry. Come down before he dies. Death is, so far as natural law is concerned, the point of no return. We're just not able to make non-living things come back to life. Life is a thing we can take, we can, or, and we could preserve it, uh, we can conserve it, but we cannot impart life to non-living things. That's why we take the bodies of people who die, even young people who die, and bury them in the ground. There's just nothing we can do for them anymore. Jesus is going to act before death here, but he doesn't have to. In fact, in chapter 11, Jesus intentionally lets his friend Lazarus die. And he didn't have to do that then either. He just wanted to. He intentionally, intentionally let Lazarus enter the tomb. Nothing, I think, demonstrates the power of the deity of Christ more than, than the way he gives life to non-living bodies. That's why the story of Lazarus is such a highlight. But he doesn't raise the dead here, but it's well within the scope of his power. The Father just doesn't realize the extent of the power of Jesus. Now, Jesus says in verse 50, Go, your son lives. Now, this is, this is genius. Here's a frantic father who is now confronted with, with a dilemma. Leave and take the chance that his son isn't better. He's going to have to come back and find Jesus again, and it'll be too late. Or stay and keep begging. Jesus is going to, he is asking the father to believe more about his power than he believed. You believe that I can, that you believe that if I come down, I can heal your son. That's great. But do you believe that if I just send you home, I can heal your son from afar? We talked last week about the maturing of faith and the detour of faith. We talked about faith growing and Faith being placed not in Jesus' power as the Son of God, but in Jesus' power to perform miracles. Here's a, here's a man whose faith has been detoured. He's only here because he believes that Jesus can perform miracles. But Jesus is going to take that faith and grow it and mature it and put it back 
uh, or put it on the right track. And he does that by stretching. And he, puts, he does it by putting this particular father in a position where the only options he has are to trust Jesus' word or continue begging for something it seems Jesus is rather unwilling to do. And that is to make the journey to the child's bedside. And Jesus is asking this man to believe his word. That's it, plain and simple. The power of Jesus is not in magical hands or some mystical aura emanating from his body that he has to be within three feet of whoever he's healing. The power of Jesus is in his word, the same word that spoke darkness and created, spoke into darkness and created light, the same word that spoke into nothing and created something, the same word that spoke into non-life and created life. And up until this point, this father hadn't intended to go there. The question is now, will he? And wonderfully, he does. In verse 50, we read that the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. He believed that when Jesus said, your son lives, Jesus actually did what he asked him to do. And how strong this man's faith was at that point, it's hard to say. How many doubts he might have had, we don't know. How well he slept that night, we don't know that either. I don't know if he, he slept much at all. He didn't have cell phones to check and see what the immediate condition of his son was. But what we know is that he obeyed Jesus' command to go, and he went. And so on his way home, in verse 51, he's met by some of his servants who are coming up to find him. And that's how we did things before cell phones. You remember that? We actually had to go and find a person. You just had to locate the actual person. I wonder why they came to find him. Maybe they were overjoyed at the recovery of the boy, and they couldn't wait to tell their master. Or, or maybe because they... They also believe that Jesus needed to be present, and so they're going to go find their master and tell him he doesn't need to bother bringing Jesus anymore. But at any rate, when they meet, they relate the story, and, and the man asks the obvious question, well, when did this happen? And we're not surprised, I don't think, to discover that it happened when Jesus said, your son lives. And verse 53 then concludes, he himself believed and his whole household. And that's where Jesus has been going from the beginning. The goal in Jesus' eyes was never ultimately about healing, even though it is a great and noble and compassionate and all those adjectives to describe the mercy that Jesus shows to this family. But ultimately, it was about this man and his family coming to understand that Jesus is not merely a miracle worker interested in their physical health and well-being. He is the Son of God to be embraced and worshipped and obeyed. And so here is, I think, a really incredible example of how Jesus takes a situation that could be of, could be potentially of absolutely no eternal benefit. If Jesus just tags along and heals this child, it's potentially of absolutely no eternal benefit, but he transforms it into the means by which this family comes to receive not just the life of their child, but eternal life from the hand of Christ himself. So here are some things we can ask ourselves. How do we come to Jesus? How do we, how do we approach him with our needs? How do we think about our physical and our material needs in relationship to Jesus? What do we pray when we pray? Why do we pray it? What do we make of Jesus when he doesn't seem as interested in fixing our problems as we are in having them fixed? This is an amazing little story. The complexity of Jesus' relationship to his miracles here is, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it's really sweet. And, and what a joy that Jesus is primarily interested in eternal life and secondarily in the physical well-being, even of his people. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to work our way through this, uh, this text tonight and to ponder uh, the wonderful miracles of our Lord Jesus. Father, help us to understand the priority of Christ, of the health of our eternal soul, as opposed to the well-being of our physical bodies. And 